Let's get into the program, PolySand Disasters. Mike, what, what do we have on the table that has anything to do with PolySand? Well, you don't think uh, six by sixes and steel angle iron have anything to do with polymeric sand? I, I don't know, unless maybe we're building a covered bridge, maybe, or something like that. Well, I don't these know. are great building materials, right? Indeed. You know, six, six by sixes, you can build all kinds of things out of lumber, steel, you know, you build skyscrapers, Strong, bridges. Rigid. Yep. You know, they're wonderful to build with. For sure. They're typically very long lasting, but they might not be. You know, in certain conditions, if they're not installed properly, if they're in the wrong environment, Yep. They can have some issues too. And that wrong environment leads to some real problems. So I think we've got a transformation of what these products ultimately look like when they face our number one enemy in polymeric sand, water. Right. So water, you know, hey, it sustains life on earth, but it can cause problems for many materials, including lumber and steel, right? Steel rusts. You can see that angle iron all rusted and pitted. Yeah. And this wood is obviously rotting, has moss growing on top of it. So water does degrade building materials for sure. Right. And polymeric sand is a great building material. We make a living off of it. So it is great for its application. But when it's misused or not installed right, it leads to problems just like these other building materials do. So I think that's what we want to talk about here is really what does polymeric sand do and how does it take form? Right. So Polymeric sand is basically a powdered glue yep. that's mixed in with a specially calibrated sand. And when it's activated with water, it starts to become gummy and cohesive. As it dries out, it sets up and becomes hard. Yep. So you have a nice hard material in the joints that provides interlock, helps prevent weeds, burrowing insects, erosion, sure. like we talked about last week on our show. Yeah, excellent. So if we take our polymeric sand when it's done right, we all, we're all happy. But when we don't do it right, it leads to problems. So I think we can show what that problem looks like with poly sand. Right. So first of all, when you first activate polymeric sand, Alliance products, you know, G2 polymeric sand with rapid set, they're rain safe in 15 minutes, right? Sure, but rain safe means a lot of different things to a lot of different uh, people. So what are we talking about rain safe? Well, many people think that rain safe means that it's hard in 15 minutes. It's yeah. rock solid like this table, right? Sure. That's not how it works. Yeah. Now, rain safe means that it's going to be sticky, gummy, cohesive. It's going to resist erosion okay. or washout from rainfall. Polymeric sands don't harden up until they dry. Okay, so I think we got a graphic here that really details what you're talking about with that whole rain safe. So let's pull that up, Mayank, and let's talk a little bit more about that definition of rain safe. So when we're talking about rapid set technology, we say rain safe in 15 minutes. So that means it has a cure time that really based on the weather and the moisture content of outside conditions, and that third point really is it's when it's fully dry, only at that point, Mike, can it be fully cured. Correct. And if it never dries out, it's never going to get hard. So right. we need to make sure that our jobs are designed to drain, to drain water out so that that polymeric sand can perform as it's supposed to. Great. What do we have here? I think you're going to demonstrate that. Right. So we uh, took apart a paver job yesterday and we pulled some material out of the joints. Okay. And these came out of the same joint. This piece right here is obviously sitting in water. This piece in my hand, dry. No, it looks rigid. It's not moving, flexing, or anything. It looks decent. Right. So polymeric sand, once it dries out, is a pretty hard material. It's stiff. It doesn't bend, but it can snap. It can become fairly brittle. Right? Okay. So we're going to put a lot of force on that and snap it in half. It cracked Yep. without bending. Right. Yep. Extreme condition. Sure. Polymeric sands harden up when they dry. They soften up when they're wet. So this has been soaking for about 24 hours. And you can see that with this product, you know, it's softened up to the point where I can turn it inside out. Yeah. Into a U shape. Very flexible. Very flexible. I think the whole benefit of polymeric sand, right? So that's a very desirable feature, right? We get that softening effect, which allows it to flex even more, yep. self heal if there's any cracking that occurs. The problem, though, is if it stays wet for a week at a time, a month at a time, sure. for a very long time, it is eventually going to degrade and suffer. Right? Right. We want polymeric sand to cycle. Dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, soft, hard, soft, hard. That can happen a million times, but it's a problem if it doesn't cycle. 
That's a big problem, and one of the problems we often see that we define as a disaster. So if you take a look, we've got a graphic here that shows you that, I'll call it a circle of life, if you will. A but, circle of life for polymeric sand. Sure. Least. And once that polymeric sand is activated, it'll enter this circle of life. And Mike, walk us through what we have here. Right. So as it dries out, it hardens. You get rain on your project. That polymeric sand softens. It's like a we saw more here. flexible, it self heals any cracking that may occur. And then once the sun comes out, your job dries, the polymeric sand dries and hardens up, and the cycle starts all over again. So that cycle is fantastic until that cycle gets short circuited in right. some way. Yeah. So, and talking about that short circuit, so let's say. We have a, I mean, of course, this is an extreme condition, but we've got conditions maybe where the sand is not completely submerged in water, but it's submerged underneath. Right. There's lots of ways to construct a patio yeah. or a driveway or a walkway for that matter. And some allow better drainage than others, right? right? Of course. So one of the common installation methods that we see is the concrete overlay. Right, which gives you a nice firm base so you don't have to worry about a base settling right, with overlay. Right, it's a great foundation, but unfortunately, water doesn't go through a concrete slab. No, it's a, it, it has a lot of problems for that water aspect. So we would need to drill weep holes, right? Right. So Can you help me out, George? Absolutely. So we would recommend drilling weep holes. Wait so, a minute, wait a minute. You're going to drill weep holes with that? Well, it, it's a drill. I got a nice bit. That's I, I like get a through. toy. Come on, it's a nice Milwaukee. All right, Lou, can you help us out? I think that uh, we're going to turn it over to Lou, who's got some real uh, power tools. He's got a core drill over there. He's going to show us how we should really handle a concrete overlay. Yes, thanks, Mike and George. And um, Mike, you're absolutely right. That uh, starter kit of George's is just not going to work. But hey, Gator Nation, uh, what's up? Lou from New Jersey. And I wanted to show you how to properly drill uh, core in a concrete slab so that you can cr create enough drainage. And then you would use a, a heavy duty drill such as this with a minimum two inch diameter coring drill bit. So, what do you say we uh, get right to it? There you have it. All right, so let's cut to this GoPro shot and we'll show you what that uh, core drilled chunk looks like. You know, that's sizable. That is a two inch core drilled hole. You need to put those every three or four feet on center. Remember, water has to travel over that concrete slab, get to these holes and drain through it. You also need to make sure that your soils can take any water, you know, allow that water to drain through the hole and into the native soils. If you've got clay soils, you might need to do some piping or you know extra drainage measures underneath yeah. that concrete slab. That's a, a, a massive hole. It, it always amazes me. Every time we talk about this, I, I'm, I'm always dumbfounded. That you, that's really what we need. Let's go to that overhead shot for a second here, so you can see the difference there. You know, a two-inch hole versus a half-inch hole, George. How many times larger is a two-inch hole than a half-inch hole? Boy, that's a good question, Mike. I, I don't know what that, that would be, but I'm going to say it's more than 10 times as big. Right. So. It's actually 16 times larger. Yep. So you're going to get 16 times the water flow through a two-inch hole than a half-inch hole. It's less likely to clog from debris. It's just going to be a much better application for polymeric sand. You know, right. you know drier job, less efflorescence on your pavers and you'll allow that water to go right through. Yeah, so we talk about building materials. We showed you a little demo up front here, and then we talk about the disasters. A, a good building material, also the concrete overlay, but the disaster is the wrong weed poles. I think what you wanna show here is what happens to water in these two scenarios. We don't see weed poles very uh, often at all, and, and if we do, we might see that. I don't think I've ever seen a real weep hole like this out on a job site. Right. I typically go to a concrete overlay job and the guy might have done 10 or 12 holes, you know, yeah. half inch holes in a thousand square foot job. You know, you need to have 30 or 40 two inch core drilled holes in that slab to allow it to drain properly. And we simulated a little patio build here. We've got our border course that's glued down to the pavers, right? That's yep. blocking water flow off. Right. That's a typical patio construction, too, on an overlay. You would have your patio border glued or mortared in, and that just presents a dam from that water getting out. 
Yep. So next week, uh, living on the edge, we'll show you some ways that you can, uh, you know, minimize that effect and create drainage through your edge course. But today we blocked off that water flow to prove a point about the water flowing down through the holes there. And I think that's we have a great a shameless plug that'll lead us right into commercial break for this question. So Topher, I think we've got a question, right? We've got two questions coming up. Russ Renner asks, what does fully cured mean with regards to time? So I think he's asking, how long is it going to take for poly sand like you were doing before to yeah. be cured in time? Well, there's no actual answer to that question. Time yep. doesn't matter. Drying it's not 23 does. days? It's not 28 days like concrete. It's yep. not 23 days. The polymeric sand simply has to dry. So that might take six hours on a 105-degree day in Arizona, but it might take two weeks in you know, wet, humid sure. weather in the northeast or the southeast. Yeah, you've, we've got some uh, of our friends from British Columbia, you know, a little of that you know, whole Pacific Northwest. It's soggy. It's damp. It's going to take a long time to cure, much different than it might be in, say, Texas in the middle of the summer. So uh, the, the cure time is for a function of weather Correct. and climate. So you know, for what's the next question? John wants to know, once I've gone ahead and drilled my uh, core hole, what do I fill that with? Good question. So you want to fill it with a stone that allows water to drain. Yeah. So you can fill it with, uh, you know, three eighths chip, a three quarter inch uh, clean stone. You know, um, ICPI does recommend pea gravel, but I'd go with more of that angular stone that can yep. pack a little bit better. Right. And then make sure you're putting a piece of filter fabric, a GF, you know, 4.4, some kind of non-woven geotextile over that hole to yeah. prevent any migration of sand, dirt, and debris Makes or your sense. bedding material into it. Great. So, yeah, so I, let's get to it. In, in that question, to John's question, this hole would be filled with some sort of aggregate to clog, not to clog the hole, but to fill the hole. And provide support. Give it, yep, a little bit more stability. And then you're ready to lay pavers and finish the all patio, right? So right? can finish their patio first. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I wish they were all this easy, right? Just finish our patio and let's get the furniture out. All right. So we have our patios laid and we're going to simulate a rainstorm. So remember, this is the patio that only has that half inch hole underneath yep. and for our example here the water only has to travel what an inch and a half two yeah, inches to get to the hole. not very far think about a real job where your water has to travel three or four feet to get to each hole yeah so let's get that let's rain see. flow in here and see what happens so it's falling down the crack in the pavers it's starting to drain through the hole we've got some good drainage going but the water's backing up in our joints here and starting to fill up to the top. Yeah, I think the overhead can show that. So that really shows, you know, decent drainage with the weep hole, but you do see the water, and I don't know if the overhead picks it up, it starts filling the joints. And eventually, over time, those joints get filled and more full, and they remain soft and, and damp and soggy. Let's take a look at what it should look like here. So you can see here, that water pouring through, no collection of water in the joint itself, and eventually this one's going to dry out much more cleanly than the one with the small weep hole, and certainly a heck of a lot more cleanly with no weep holes. Right. So make sure you put those weep holes in your concrete slab. You know, it should look like a piece of Swiss cheese. Yeah. It holes every, you know, three or four feet in a grid pattern, and then make sure that that water can drain into the native soils. Yeah. Good. So it looks like we got another question, Topher. Yep. Bob is asking, why can I not just drill holes at the lowest point of my concrete pad for drainage? Well, if you are doing a project that's about the size of this, or yep. maybe two foot by two foot, you certainly can. But if you're doing anything sizable, water is not going to travel very well underneath the paver surface, right? The pavers themselves are going to block off the right. flow of water to some degree if you use a sand or, or chip setting bed. That's got some resistance to water flow. So, you know, with the minimal pitch that most projects have, yeah. and then that resistance to water flow from the materials on top, you're never going to have all that water reach a certain point, you know, the low point of a project. Yeah. So it really depends on the scale of the patio, but we recommend, I think, Mike, the general rule of thumb is you want these two-inch weep holes at what spacing? 
about every three or four feet and certainly add them you know yeah. extra at the low areas where water may gather or collect right so we've seen a lot of disasters with overlays because weep holes were not deployed here so if you're going to do weep holes do it right get the right tools lou showed you the great tool that you need not that little toy drill that i had but get a drill make that two inch weep hole fill it with your aggregate and make sure it's done right so we move from now from the uh, overlay to other materials that are used for base construction. And other materials that may cause problems. Right. You know, one of which is stone dust or screenings. So as a setting bed, stone dust and screenings are popular in some areas. They're cheap. You know, you yep. can walk on top of that setting bed. But it's really a problem because screenings don't allow water or moisture to travel through. Yeah. And it's stone dust, terrible idea but it's used widely, but don't take our word for it. We'll show you here a few things of, of why we feel it uh, is the wrong product. But again, all of our partners, whether Techoblock, Unilock, Cambridge, Nicolock, Basilite out in California, all of our friends at Cambridge, they all will not warranty their products when stone dust is used. And what's the main reason for that? All the fines in stone dust, all that silty, dusty yep. particles in there, they just trap and block moisture flow. So as water flows in, it absorbs that water. Those molecules kind of become mud yeah. and muck and prevent any more water from traveling down. Yeah. And they hold that water like a sponge. Just a so spongy, they keep soggy that project mess. wet for a longer period of time, which keeps the paper wet, keeps the polymeric sand wet, right. and causes problems. So we did a little test here. We recreated and simulated the uh, behavior of stone dust, and we compared that with the behavior of concrete sand, which is the material you should be using. So if you want to avoid disasters, let's walk you through a couple of demos here. Mike, I think the first one's stone dust. Yep, so you can see there we're showing you how water travels into a stone dust setting bed. And you can see initially it starts to trickle in and wet down that stone dust, but then that stone dust starts to repel the water and you can see it backing up and building up and filling up. Uh, you know, we're probably about uh, half inch high on the edge of that paper yeah, now you, and growing. And you can see that water level rising. Never a good opportunity for, uh, you know, for using uh, any kind of paver or certainly any joint sand. So now what we want to do is take a look at what it would look like if we actually use the right material, concrete sand. Right. So an ASTM C33 concrete sand, it's a coarser gradation material. It yeah. doesn't have those fine, silty particles, you know, angular in nature. It's going to allow water to drain right through it. So here you can see you get a much better water flow, and that's that water flow now starts going more deep down in, into the material, evacuating away from that joint. That's really what we want to see. And Mike, I see a little buildup, but then it quickly dissipates. Right. So we're overwhelming the capacity for water flow temporarily, but as soon as it has a chance to suck down and catch up, that water's migrating downward, and it's going to continue to seep downward. Yep. So now we have two avenues for water to escape instead of just one. Yeah, and, and that really is going to help you avoid any disasters. We keep harping this water thing, water, water, water. That's a big enemy of ours, and we'll talk about that as the installation side in a minute. But the other thing we want to touch base on is compaction, Mike. Right, and compaction is probably one of the most common issues that we see with polymeric sand installs. Yeah. If you don't compact your sand, it's going to come back and be a problem in the future. Yeah. I don't know what we're looking at here, but I'm guessing it's got something to do with compaction. Well, let's just pretend that <laughs> these are pavers, you know, and then what we have in the middle of each paver is a joint. Is a joint. Right? All so right. We've simulated some paver joints here, a little larger scale than normal. Yep. And then we filled it with our beautiful gray G2 Max polymeric sand. This looks great. So what we're looking at here is a joint filled with sand that has been compacted. Right. So over here, you can see that the sand has been densely compacted, right? So all the sand particles are closer together. Yep. There's less void space. Right. So that means that the sand is going to be stronger. Yes. It's going to bond together tighter. Okay. And if it bonds together stronger and tighter, less water is going to flow into it. So now we're solving a lot of problems, right? Sure. Sand stronger. Less water flows through it. That's ideal. Yep. Best strength. On this side, this is our same situation here. Beautiful G2 gray poly sand. But that contractor skipped the compaction step. Yep. Came in, swept it in, said, hey, let's move to the next step. 
wrong answer. Right. You can see how far apart those particles are. That sand is loose and fluffy, and there's a lot of void space. So now that sand is not as strong as it's supposed to be. Right. It allows far more water to get down into that base material that sure. we don't want. Sure. And I think part of the deception here is, of course, our little hokey demo here. Uh, you can see void space, but in a traditional install, Mike, this is full to the top, so it looks like I'm done. Right. But, Until you actually come in and compact, right? Okay. So let's simulate compacting this joint and see what happens. If we compact, uh-oh. We're way down. That just dropped about 50% of the joint height there. Yeah, and when we have that compaction issue, we've got a great graphic that shows you what that compaction does to the strength of our overall joint. So if you compact, you are going to get 50% more sand in that joint. Right. That means a much stronger joint. So if you skip that compaction step, you're missing 50% of the sand. That joint's 50% of the strength that it should be. So it's much weaker. So that compaction step is critical. We see that frequently where that compaction step is skipped and overlooked. That leads to weaker joints because you don't have enough sand in there. You don't have enough glue binder polymer in there. And then all of that relates to water because it's not able to resist water well enough. So that is the importance of compaction. The other thing is, again, don't just listen to George and Mike on this stuff. You can go to ICPI and they recommend it, don't they? Well, the compaction is important just to make sure that your particles are densely packed, whether you're using polymeric sand or regular sand to provide the proper interlock. Yeah, super important. We have another question here, Topher. Yeah, John is asking or stating, I am using more and more large format pavers, uh, more and more large format pavers, and I'm told to not compact these. What do I do to not contradict your sand installation? Well, every joint should be compacted in some fashion, and mechanical compaction with some kind of plate compactor or roller compactor is going to be the best. Yeah. And as far as I'm aware, every large format slab out there can be compacted with a roller compactor. For sure. And I can see, Mike, you're talking about tools here. You lightened up. It's a good opportunity to buy the right tool. Get a roller compactor. We can uh, we can get in touch with you, and we have uh, a lot of partnerships with tools, tool companies. But the roller compactor is such an incredibly useful tool, especially this day and age, Mike, with all these large format uh, slabs. Right. It provides very gentle vibration and consolidation to the joints, right. so you're not getting that hard impact force that could damage or crack a large format slab. It's really perfect to set the polymeric sand. Sure. So to to that question, I would say do some form of compaction, get the roller compactor, and certainly talk to your alliance rep. We have contacts that we can uh, direct you if you're not, you know, not sure where to buy one and talk to people about it. Your alliance rep can be a great resource in that, in that capacity. And if you don't have a roller compactor, you know, you're working with some large slabs or maybe you're working with a very thin natural stone. Yep. Uh, you know, hand tamp it. You know, can you put a hand tamper on it with a rubber pad? Can you use a mallet, a two by four? Whatever you can do to get some consolidation and vibration is better than nothing. Sure. Mike, any visuals or anything? If I am doing a hand tamp type of uh, method, are there any visuals or anything I should be looking for to know I've got that compacted? Well, you obviously want to keep going until the sand stops settling down into the joint, right? Okay. So you want that sand to stop settling down into the joint, and you want to see the pavers or the stone kind of shaking as you're hitting them with the mallet or two by four or hand tamp. Sure. You know, if you're standing on it and it's not, moving yeah well you're not getting much vibration force you're not causing those particles to settle if you see some movement of the stone that sand dropping you know you're getting a little bit of vibration yeah. and consolidation there makes sense great so we want to move on to the next disaster we've talked about materials and we've talked about installation and compaction the other issue we see oftentimes it creates a disaster is an overfilled paver joint People seem to love putting polymeric sand right up to the top of a paver, and yeah. that's a bad idea on several levels. First of all, I think it looks terrible. I think it looks terrible, and as a salesperson, it's probably the only time I'm going to say don't use a lot of polymeric sand because we don't want that joint overfilled. It leads to problems. Right. A polymeric sand joint that's overfilled is going to be prone to potentially swelling up above the surface of the paver sure. when it gets wet. You know, polymeric sands expand a little bit when they're in that wet, softer state. 
So we don't want it to expand where car tires are hitting it, foot traffic is hitting it. You know, the paver is meant to be yeah. the wearing course, not the joint. Sure. And and here's an example of where we've misfired on that. I think if we can get a good shot on a GoPro, it shows you this joint is over full. And so it's taking some of the impact of uh, foot traffic and certainly vehicle traffic, which could be detrimental. Right. And the other thing that you see is with these overfilled joints, if it's above the vertical portion of the paver, it's going to tend to almost try to peel away as there's any movement or there's some of that expansion happening yeah. when it gets wet. So you could have that start to peel away from the edges of the paver. You could start to have it come out in strands. You know, it's really not ideal. Right. And so we, we, uh, if we could bring up that overfilled joint picture again, let's just talk about that for a quick second and show you what happens there. You can see that is over full. A couple of other problems there. Yeah, it looks like, like they skip their compaction as yeah, well, Yeah, right? if we look down in that lower left-hand corner, we can see a big void space because that was not compacted properly. So we've got some big issues with the overfilled joints that lead to problems here. So the other thing that we want to talk about here is that um, we got to water it right. Let's come back to the water. In this case, it's not water after the fact. It's water during the application. Right. And part of the problem is, you know, what we've told people through the years, yeah. right? And the way polymeric sands have evolved. Originally, the instruction was mist it lightly and walk away. You don't right. have to wash the polymers out of it. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. The way polymeric sands are manufactured, you can't wash the polymers out. And I'd say that not, you know, 95% of jobs these days are underwatered rather than overwatered. Yeah, for sure. And I think we're going to show you the difference between properly watering a, a joint and improperly watering a joint. So what are we going to do here, Mike? Right. So we're going to simulate a watering here. So if we water this and we water it very lightly. Okay. And we don't come back, we don't add enough water, it's going to form a crust. Yep. And that thin crust is going to repel any subsequent water that we add to it. Sure. And we see that disaster all too often. So, so let's water this one here. Let's give it a shot. So if I come in and start watering, you can see that a very light watering has activated what? You know, an eighth of an inch, Yep. a, a, a quarter inch, a very, very thin crust there. So that dark line is as deep as the water got. Yep. That dark line is as deep as that polymeric sand is going to harden up. Yeah, and we always call that you get a you know just a thin skin on the product, and that leads to a disastrous results. Well, there's a lot of problems that can come from a thin skin, and we'll tackle a few of those. But yeah. obviously, something that's hardened an eighth of an inch thick is going to be nowhere near as strong as something that's an inch and a half sure. thick, right? Absolutely. I think we've got a great photo of that improper watering and what that looks like as an end result. So if we pull that up, that's that skin we're talking about. Right. So, you know, only activated that top layer and then eventually hydrostatic pressure started to push that water up or move or, or, and push the skin up. Maybe some paver movement in a driveway caused to start lifting up but that was not activated properly. No, and that leads to some real problems. And not only Mike wearing your Birkenstocks out there, that's a real problem, but we get that real thin skin and that leads to you know all those after problems of the bubbling and so forth. So you got to water right. Let's look at how we should really be watering right. this stuff. So we need to make sure that we get enough water into the joint fast enough to activate the material an inch and a half to two inches down. And that's super important with the G2 material because it has the rapid set technology. Right, so general rule of thumb on watering? 30 seconds for 30 square feet. Okay. Now, that's a, a good ballpark, it at least gets you started. Yep. But you need to water to the point where that joint is rejecting water. So 30 seconds for 30 square feet is a good rule of thumb, but if you have a wide joint, you know that's a lot of polymeric sand to activate, you might need to do 30 square feet for 60 seconds. Okay. Big jump there, almost two, twice as much. Right. So water it until you start to see water puddle and pond on the surface and then move on to the next area. Makes a lot of sense. So let's, so uh, let's, let's see let's what we have here. Demonstrate that here with this section. So we're going to just keep adding water to this and get that water to keep trickling down and activate that joint nice and deep. We want to make sure that we get a nice initial yeah, really activation over here because that is going to help the long-term performance of our sand. That initial activation is very, very important. Yeah. 
So now, obviously, you're not going to use a little squeeze bottle on a job site, but this is a little slow. But <laughs> but I get the picture. Like you're doing probably two or three times what we normally see. And and I know when we send our sales guys out into the field, I've heard over and over again from contractors, "Wow, that's a lot of water. I don't normally use that much water." It takes a lot of water. It's a dry material. That glue is thirsty. It wants water, right? Yeah. So we're going to need to give it enough water to have that suck all the way down and make sure that we don't have a thin crust disaster. Sure. And with the rapid set technology, it's important to do it in one shot. I can't go back and water that after I've left for a long time, right? Not even a long time, George. Yeah. You know, three or four minutes, that's starting to repel water. So you've got to get all that water in in one shot. You know, a hot summer day, you know, large project, you have to work in smaller areas. Yeah. Get that water and all those joints completely activated and soaked before you move on to the next section. Sure. So we talked about all these different building materials, avoiding different types of disasters. We showed the impact of products left in water and the impact of not watering. The one thing we always get, and it comes from that picture that we just saw with the skin, it's this bubbling thing. What does that come from? Well, I always get people that want to pop that bubble, right? Yeah. They just want to pop that bubble and uh, <laughs> see what happens. Like a big zit or something, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's it's tempting. But your best bet when you see a bubble in polymeric sand is to leave it alone. Yeah. And that picture says it all. You know, if that were a project, it does not look good at all. So we've got to get the right uh, watering done because that bubbling comes from something. It comes from a thin skin. And yep. then... <laughs> more water yeah at the wrong time so and it's not only with polymeric sand we talk about building products all the time you've done a great job looking at demos and showing and uh, having some great illustrations it, if we can look at this on a close-up we've got a paint it, i think you were throwing together the other day with some just some regular old paint on a, yeah, on a wooden block I, I did a little painting yesterday we've got a couple of paint related examples to show you but yep. this paint uh, unfortunately bubbled up it bubbled up quite a bit, and that's unsightly. My wife is now pretty pissed off. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to call the Sherwin-Williams rep and get him out here and tell him we got a problem with the paint. It's a good idea. Let's see what he, <laughs> see what he says. I think he's going to tell you that you just have some kind of a water problem or a delamination problem, right? Was it dirty underneath that paint? Did water get behind yeah. that paint? That paint's completely fine. The film's completely fine, but water, you know, push that out. Some kind of dirt, you know, heat-related delamination occurred. And that's the same thing with a bubbling polymeric sand joint. Yeah. If that's not activated deep enough, you end up with a thin crust, and eventually water gets in there, hydrostatic pressure just pushes that up as that water expands and reaches for the surface to drain out of a project. It's yeah. very common on concrete overlays and stone dust projects. Yeah, and that's really why we wanted to harp on that. Those disasters often come from improper materials at the base level that lead to water problems, which lead to bubbling, which lead to all these other disasters and unsightly projects. Right. And since we're on the topic of paint, uh, I've got another little example here. You, you better call your Sherwin-Williams rep, right? Yep. I painted that the other day, and that looks terrible. Yeah, spider webbing, cracking, spider webbing, all kinds cracking. of problems. Now, is that a paint defect, George? Or well, sure. I would call the Sherwin-Williams rep and say your paint cracked. But, you know... I might not have let you know that there was a big oil spot on that piece of wood before I painted wow. it. And it's that big oil spot where the paint didn't adhere and it's cracking. So, you know, that was really my fault. I yep. didn't install that paint properly, didn't prep properly. So we've got a lot of issues that are caused by these materials and, and improper installations. So Topher, I think we got another question here. We've got a handful more. So I'm just going to pick on a couple and encourage anybody to reach out to their local rep if a question didn't get answered during this uh, webinar here. Um, Ryan's stating the biggest fear with using a lot of water is that the poly sand will start to bubble foam. And we always assume that that foam would stain the pavers underneath or that foam may be the polymer leaching well out. that's a very good question and a very common question so when you water polymeric sand you'll often see a white foam develop it's almost yes. you know bubbly like bubbly. soap right sure it is and in Dish fact soap. it is very much like soap that is called a surfactant and a chemical surfactant is added into our mix to help suck water down deeper into the sand it makes it easier for that water to travel down through that sand joint Side effect is that it bubbles a little bit because it's similar to a soap. So yep. that's not a cause for concern. That's a sign that you're watering it properly. 
Uh, it's a sign that the water is soaking down deep into the sand, and that is not going to leave any haze or residue. You know, if you left those bubbles all over the surface, they're going to dissipate and disappear as it dries out. Yeah. And I think the big point you're making here is it's not a product defect. It's part of the installation. You might see those bubbles and it's nothing to worry about. It won't leave haze. It's just part of that installation process. So not something to worry about. Although since we're on the topic now, yep. uh, we get a close up of Yep, let's get a close up of this. What are we looking at here, Mike? Well, we have a haze paver, right? Sure. <laughs> Poly sand haze, right? Hey, is it or isn't it? Always tough to tell. When polymeric sands first came out, haze was a real problem. You know, you would install your pavers, you would sweep polymeric sand off across the surface, and if you didn't follow all those steps to the letter, you ran the risk of having some discoloration, sure. some residue on the surface. But polymeric sands have come a long way since then. Yeah, the G2, as we've talked, is a product that has has no binds really, and, and it's a no, dustless product. So it's not going to haze the pavers. Older products still didn't haze the pavers when installed properly. Right. Another thing that you may see when you first install pavers and install polymeric sand is an efflorescence issue. Sure. So a lot of times pavers go down. First time they really see a lot of water is the sand application. Watering application of the right? sand, right. And you get some whiteness that pops out afterwards. You know, it's quite possible that's efflorescence and not a haze issue. Right. So we talk about disasters. This one, whether it's haze or whether it's a efflo issue, not really a disaster. There's easy ways to fix these. Right. Simple efflo cleaning takes care of either problem. So yeah. Not the end of the world. But the technology of polymeric sand is advanced to the point where this really is not a problem anymore. Right. And neither one, like you say, no problem. Neither one are disastrous that we need to worry about. Efflorescence is a naturally occurring process, as, as you know, and ICPI has great literature on it. So it's nothing to worry about. It's, it's a cu quick, curable disaster, if that. Yep. What uh, other questions did we have, Topher? Uh, let's see here. We've got... Um, da -da 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 caught me off guard there because i was scrolling through thanks mike all right well we'll give you a second to catch up while he's doing that let's pull up we've got another image here called cracking which is a little bit misleading so we often hear hey your polymeric sand has cracked but mike i don't think the polymeric sand actually cracks does it uh it's very rare you know polymeric sand is pretty tough stuff and it's not the joint that's cracking right down the middle. Where's yeah. that crack occurring? That crack is coming from actually movement. So I think you got a good demo here that shows that movement and that crack. Right. So when pavers start to move and shift, yep. well, that looks like a crack to me now, right? Right. Except the polymeric sand's doing its job. It's flexible, like we first showed. To a certain degree, though. Right. At some point, that paver is going to move so much that that poly sand can't hang on. Uh, if we can go back to that image um, of the cracking here, we can walk you through a couple examples that really show that where the, the pavers move so much that it gives you the, the, the look of the uh, paver, or excuse me, the sand cracking, but it's really movement of the pavers that causes that disaster. Right. And overfilling your joints can make it, you know, even more of a problem than it would have been had you filled them correctly. So sometimes multiple issues compound themselves and lead to a bigger disaster. Sure. So these are issues that we see quite frequently. You've got pavers like that, um, one that was just up on the screen. They require compaction. They require the right base materials underneath because a lot of times that movement, like, can be caused from water itself, causing the whole system to move. Or edge restraint failure. Edge restraint failure, another shameless plug for what's coming up here with Living on the Edge, another great program that we want to offer, talking about various edge restraints and materials to make sure that that's done right. But we'll get to that later. Yep. So, Topher, any more questions here? Yeah, a couple we're going to catch up for a couple from, from earlier in the class. Is cured poly sand permeable? And does water leach under the pavers once it is cured? All right. So cured polymeric sand is not permeable. Permeable to me means that water freely flows through a material. And once polymeric sand is cured, 
it effectively yeah. repels water. It is going to absorb some water. Right. Pavers absorb water, right? The absorption rate on a paver is supposed to be less than 5%. Less than 5, yep. So polymeric sand may absorb a little more water, but it is definitely not a permeable material. Now, yeah. how does water get underneath a paving stone system? Well, all kinds of different ways. Once a patio or driveway is installed, water comes in through the edges, you know, the yeah. disturbed areas um, of the ground next to the project. It works its way underground and, and comes through. And then some will work through the paver or the polymeric sand. But I would say almost every hardscape project out there is wet underneath. Yeah, and it's for just a sure. matter of how wet. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, some moisture, of course, the uh, poly sand, it's resilient, carries a 15 year warranty. But you get into some of the other demonstrations that we had where it's sitting in a bathtub, those overlays with no weep holes, stone dust where it's spongy and just sitting in a spongy bath of water. I think that's what you're talking about, too wet. Right. Well, it's the same thing with us, right? Some water is OK. Yeah. You don't want to be stuck in the middle of the ocean without a boat. Right, right for sure. <laughs> Topher, what else we have? Going to throw you a softball to lead into our next class. Alec is asking, what is the recommended product for the joints in between pavers and paver edging, poly edging, and, ed and any other edge material? The recommended material for a joint between the paver and the edge, huh? I yeah. don't think there should be a joint between the paver and the edge. What do you think? George? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, we, uh, we have different types of edge restraint, which we'll cover in a different program. But whether you're using a plastic edge restraint, uh, one of the new uh, you know, fiber-reinforced concrete edge restraints that we have, uh, you should have that butt up to the paving stones. So there really shouldn't be a joint in there, per se. Right. That edge should go directly against your natural stone or your concrete paver because that's what's going to prevent the movement, right? If you have a joint there, you know, that joint could fail and contribute to the possibility for some right. lateral movement. Yeah. One thing's for sure, you shouldn't be using any joint fill material as your edge restraint. We've seen that before, though. Yeah, another disaster. So, great. Any other questions? Not the good all right. Good. I think we're good here, right? All right. Well, thank you for tuning in and uh, listening to us for uh, a short time here. You know, we uh, hope you find the programming useful. Mike, you've outdone it. Always great demos. Thank you for putting this together. Oh, no problem. Always fun to share some knowledge and hopefully make life easier for some of these guys out in the field. Yeah. It's always better to solve a disaster before it happens. For sure. And so if you like this and want more of it, it's AllianceGator.com slash education.